Uh, good morning. Uh, I welcome um, members of the public, uh, our witnesses and my colleagues to the fourth meeting of the Devolution for the Powers Committee for 2016. Uh, can I just remind everyone to switch off their mobile phones and put them in an order, at least certainly I can't hear them. Um, at, at the beginning, I should also give the apologies for Tavish Scott, um, who can't be here with us today. Um, agenda item one is an evidence-taking session on the post-study work visas. And I can I very much warmly welcome the witnesses to the meeting this morning, uh, Mr. Mowlin Butch who, and Mrs. Mary Jockey, both former participants in the Fresh Talent Scheme. We have Lucy Flynn, the International Officer of South Lanarkshire College, and Alan Mackay, who is the Deputy Vice Principal of the International and Director of International Office at Edinburgh University. Now, I propose to start off um, the, the discussion, in the, particularly in the impact on the economic impact on both your institutions, Lucy and Alan, um, but also the potential impact on the wider Scottish economy. So with that in mind, um, and by the way, very helpful contributions, the written contributions that were already received, um, I would just like to understand what reduction in the number of students wishing to study in Scotland as a direct result of absence on any post-study visa incentive being available, what that looks like, what that impact of the closure of Tier 1 uh, visas had on the institutions you work in, and if you could let the committee have a bit more understanding of what you would consider the closure of Tier 1's impact on the wider uh, economic growth issues in Scotland, that would be very helpful. Now, probably, Alan, do you want to kick that off? Yes, certainly. Uh, thank you. Um, what we're seeing is, uh, I think, across the Scottish sector, and the statistics uh, clearly bear that out, is uh, static or flatlining in terms of growth, in terms of non-EU student enrolments. Certainly here I'm talking about the higher education sector. So the, the recent Higher Education Statistics Authority uh, uh, figures for, for Scotland sort of are showing somewhere, depending on the way that you interpret the statistics, of a 1% or a 2% uh, growth on last year, um, with pretty steady declines in many of the, the key nations uh, that are fast emerging, fast growing, and sending large numbers of students out overseas. So if you look at India, for example, uh, that decline in Scotland in a three, four year period for the university sector was uh, declined by 63%. Uh, if you look at uh, Nigeria, I think it was somewhere in the region of about 20 to 30 percent. I need to get an exact figure on that. Uh, and for Pakistan, down 45 percent. So what you've got is you, you, you can certainly point to, to growth, yes, when you're talking about a few hundred students additional uh, every year, <laughs> one, two percent. Uh, if you look at the UK sector picture as well, one percent growth. So when you compare that to competitor nations in terms of the, the first attraction of that talent, of which post-study work is a very, very important part of that, and the wider immigration system. The United States up 10%, Germany up 7%, Canada uh, similar in terms of double-digit growth. So when you start to look at that in terms of the global context uh, of OECD growth in this area in terms of students moving around the world studying outside their country, 7% a year, I, I, do, I think it's, there's clear economic impact there in terms of uh, Scotland and its sector. When you look at the fees, the fees are worth to Scot Scottish higher education every year, £402 million. Pounds. The additional economic spend of students when they're here, uh, for all where they live, where they shop, uh, and their wider spend in Scottish society a year is over £444 million pounds a year. So you're not that shy of £1 billion pounds a year being contributed to Scotland's economy uh, uh, and, and the impact that 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 delivers. So any, any measures that seek to restrict that flow, which we're clearly seeing, I mean, I have a, a comment that I'll come back to, a quote actually from the director of the British Council in the UK and the words that he's used just last week in terms of what's happening. I think there's, there's real concern there for, for what that means for economic growth in Scotland and particularly around uh, post-study work where we're looking at, this is a pipeline. <laughs> Universities don't operate in isolation. They have direct impacts on uh, the Scottish economy uh, in terms of the, the, the development of talent and uh, the researchers, for example, that we have at my institution. There are lots of benefits there academically, financially uh, and culturally. 
And you, know, you, you start to see impacts there when you have uh, the system that we currently have in place, which is just simply not competitive compared to other nations throughout the world. And I can come back with very clear examples as to why I don't think that offer is, is competitive. Lucy, I think you're just back from China, if, 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 if my clerk's information is correct. <laughs> correct. So do you want to respond to that? Uh, I would reiterate much of what Alan has said, although um, for me it's, it's easier for me to speak specifically about South Lanarkshire College. Um, there are fewer statistics about the further education sector. Um, for us, it's a very challenging climate. As you'll see from our evidence, we've gone from having you know, up to 150 international students in a year down to one. Um, we made an active decision um, to stop recruiting in, in areas where we had traditionally recruited because it was becoming too challenging and too costly for us um, as an organisation such as we are. Um, international students would, would pay fees of up to £6,500 per year. They would also spend £10,000 per year each um, within the local economy. So y the impact is, is enormous, even within East Kilbride um, itself. Um, and like Alan said, universities don't operate in isolation. So while an HND is a qualification in its own right, many students coming to college would then go on to university. So that, that pathway is, is being lost. Can I just tease out a wee bit further? A lot of percentages there, Alan, very helpful. Having looked at the paper that was provided, um, you know, USA, Australia, 10%. Canada, 11%. Germany, 7% growth. Uh, and, and Scotland, somewhere between 1 and 2. What does that mean in numbers terms? In terms of, sorry? And for Scotland, what does it mean? If we've had a 1% growth, what does that mean in numbers terms, in terms of the number of students who are still coming? Have, you, have we got a feel uh, for that? I, I, yeah, I think what we're talking about there is the hundreds. Right. So you, you, what you're seeing is a, a clear, a clear uh, flattening off in terms of uh, over the past three to four years, which we think, uh, and not just we in terms of the universities, but others uh, would attribute that as well to, uh, to the removal of post-study work as being one of the, the key factors. It's not the only one, but it's a very, very important one, along with other changes within the immigration system that have made this and has also created the perception, which is vitally important, the perception that this is not as welcoming an offer when people look at it and get into the real detail compared to other countries throughout the world. So we're talking about hundreds, really, when you start to look. You can interpret the figures in different ways. When you look at the higher education sector in Scotland, in the top 10 non-EU sending nations to this country, you're into a few hundred students. That's the increase, the sort of few hundred. So I think it's somewhere between six and 700 uh, students when I look at the Higher Education Statistics Authority. For the top 10 non-EU or non-EEA sending nations to Scotland, you're talking a few hundred. That's during a global boom. As I've said already, and I've said in the evidence, this is a period of huge growth in terms of the number of students studying outside their, ho their home country at t for tertiary education. And I know you've said a few hundred, so that means it's a bit flexible. The numbers could be 300, it could be 700. But just if it was 500, for instance, that we were having, and we'd match the growth of you know, Canada, Australia, and the USA, we'd be talking about 5,000 people mm -hmm. who are missing out on it. Mm -hmm. Would that be a reasonable thing? I think you, you, can, you can look at uh, the, the increases in certain fast emerging economies as well across the world where you see a very large shift in terms of, I mean, it's simple demographics, you know, that's, that's the thing. There's an ex a ballooning middle class who are demanding education. If you look at Asia, that, that, that you're talking about hundreds of millions of additional people to 2030. There's a big demand there for education outside their own country. Uh, and when you look at those figures, uh, during a global period of boom for many of these uh, countries and economies, relative to the size, shape and scale of what Scotland's offer is, that growth, I would say, is, is uh, uh, we'd, on a report card, perhaps we uh, should be doing better, uh, particularly when you compare it to other countries. Uh, and I think the point made as well about the college to university pathway is very, very important. My institution, the largest number of applications we receive every year are actually from Edinburgh College. And the Australian education system uh, benefited hugely from a pipeline of students being brought in that articulate from college uh, through to university. 
And what we've seen within the college sector, not just in Scotland, but also very markedly in terms of the other institutions here, but also in terms of the UK, is a complete and utter collapse. A complete collapse. So uh, there, are, there are pathways there uh, uh, as well. But when you look at the figures, uh, you would expect to see more than 1% uh, during, uh, during what's happening across the world. And these are, you can look at the OECD figures in terms of migration of students for tertiary le level education. In particular disciplines where the impact is pronounced, because obviously that, mean, that feeds through into skill gaps in the Scottish economy. Yes, and I think there's, there's clear evidence there as well in terms of how that plays out in Scotland, particularly around uh, the STEM areas, sort of science, technology, engineering, uh, mathematics, uh, in terms of skill shortages now. Uh, the, the digital uh, and IT side of that, there's one report uh, that, that's been included in evidence that was sort of identifying that gap in Scotland of 10,000 jobs a year. So when you look at the... Uh, the, the ability for us to source some of that, perhaps as a country within uh, 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 you know, the local employment markets, and that's not there, uh, and then you look at the opportunities to retain some of the talent that we're attracting here, which is the world's best talent from across the, across the globe, uh, not being able to retain that, you've got, you've got a pretty significant problem. So I, I think there are, we, we, there have again been reports that identify skill shortages in Scotland in the medium to long term that we really need to think about. We see anything... You want to add to that at this stage? Um, yeah, I mean, it, it's not simply the removal of post-study work for students studying and further education. There are big differences in the, the terms and conditions of a visa um, for students studying at a higher education institution and a further education institution, albeit these students are studying higher education courses at a college. Um, so, for example, a student studying at a further education college has no right to work while they're in the UK. Um, in order to articulate on to university, they're required to leave the UK and return to their home country to make their application for a visa to university. So these are all reasons why um, our offering is, is less and less attractive um, to international students. Now, I know Duncan's got a supplementary. Mary and Moylan will get to you eventually, but this is an area we needed to cover inevitably at the beginning. Thanks. Thanks, you. Just, just a mad, you know, sort of anecdotal sort of uh, uh, approach to this. Uh, my local college, you know, James Watt, as it was then, reached their peak on foreign students about four or five years ago. Or, you know, so there, there has been a, a problem here. I'm trying to get to the point where we acknowledge that changes and limitations have affected our offer, undoubtedly. We need to do more, maybe, than just address the change in, in limitations that were presented with here. And that, 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 that the offer that we had through our colleges and then the university was already uh, um, uh, damaged and diminishing. You know, uh, and then additionally being impacted on the change in position. I suppose what we're, I'm talking about, even if we change these changes and limitations, our offer has still got to be better, is it not? And to compete with Canada and America and, and to use our colleges more effectively. We've got to do more than just yeah, challenge I, I th I think the restrictions is, as we see them now, if we're not. I, I think there is work to be done um, in promoting further education colleges as a legitimate pathway to university, perhaps in firming up articulation agreements with universities so that students studying on a higher national diploma programme have a guaranteed entry to university. These programmes are, are in place, yeah. um, but they're maybe not across the board. It's an interesting point in that collaboration because you know, my observation at that time is we're always competing for those students mm -hmm. and that each and every college was chasing after them, spending a lot of money as well and criticised um, uh, after that. And there didn't seem to be much coordination there. Um, I mean, I can only speak for South Lanarkshire College. Um, for example, a number of students studying our HND construction management in our last cohort um, went on to, to study at um, Glasgow Caledonian University and successfully completed their, their degree. So these, these articulations are happening. Um, they're just maybe not consistent across each but college. But why did the college sector then, you know, in the, in the main, withdraw? You money, you, how many are pursuing uh, course, courses like you are now? They're not as common as they used to be, are they, in the further education sector? 
no, a lot of colleges gave up on it, didn't they? Well, yes, but I think that has to be viewed in the context of the ever-changing UK VI regulations. Yeah. We Only in that respect? Um, it's certainly a large factor. Yeah. We could, you couldn't continue to plough the, the amount of money in to recruiting international students and the money that it costs to travel and, and to build the relationships overseas um, with partner colleges or um, to work with, with good agents. That all takes a lot of time, um, a big investment in terms also of staff. We saw a disinvestment in the further education sector as well. I beg your pardon? We saw a disinvestment in the further education se sector as well. I presume impacts in that as Yes? Yes. Thanks. Okay, listen, I know I've got other people in supplementaries, but I'm keen we get in at some stage, Mullen and Mary, because otherwise they're not getting to contribute. So I'll come back to this particular area, but I need to let, I said to Stuart Maxwell, we'd let him in in regard to specifics. So okay, I'll, I'll be, be, you, Stuart. be as quick as I can. We'll then. come to issues to do with Mary and Mullen, and then we'll come back into this area. Okay, thank you, Kirvino. Um, it, Alan, in your uh, written evidence for submission to the committee, uh, for this quote, you said, there is little doubt that the closure of the previous work-study route has been one, one of the most damaging changes in UK immigration policy for the higher education sector. Um, you say one of the most damaging, and you mentioned earlier that it's not the only issue, but you know, beyond the, these changes, what other issues have affected the, the, well, the flatlining, if you like, of the uh, number of students coming to Scotland and the UK? I think there's a range of, of factors. Uh, we've heard about the articulation routes or the pathways from uh, the Scotland's colleges through to universities and the difficulties now created around that. Having to leave college to go back overseas to apply then to come back to go to university. Mm -hmm. uh, that's not exactly a good uh, pipeline. Uh, almost total collapse of the English language sector for non-EA students as well. Many students academically qualified coming just to top up their language and then move into a college or university. I, I, I can't put a percentage on that, but it's, you, th there is evidence on that that shows a, a very, very steep decline there as well. Um, there's also, I mean, there's a whole range of other factors within the immigration system, particularly the, the continued uh, public nature of a lot of uh, what is going on is uh, frequently in the Times of India, you know, the largest English language dailies across the planet about the UK not having a a carefully articulated and well-integrated uh, strategy for promoting what it does. And Im the immigration system is a key tool in that. You can create a perception, which I think is influencing some of this, both the perception and also, as I said before, go into the detail, go into the detail, as many people do, because at any point in human history, people have information to compare and contrast, and they have choice, like we've never had in human history. So people can choose where they would like to go to. And I think that's what we have to understand is that this is a global race for talent. There's no doubt about it. Nations, cities, universities, colleges are all competing for this talent. And what we need is a well-integrated and articulated and promoted strategy that carefully links this in and thinks about through post-study work in terms of high-value talent migration uh, to the country. So th there is, there's, a, there's a whole range of factors, but I, I, I will hold with, with that comment about uh, the removal of post-study work has been one of the most damaging uh, uh, impacts for us. And I think what you see elsewhere with good post-study work options in some of the competitor nations are doing very, very well. They're double-digit growth. So it's, it's, uh, again, it's, uh, it's, it's about a package. What is the package? What is the offer? Uh, and uh, uh, if... if we don't have that, then as I say, there's choice there. People will go elsewhere. Can you quantify the impact then of the various factors in terms of, you've outlined some of them there, you've reiterated your view in terms of the written submission about the, the major impact is the changes we've seen in UK immigration policy. For example, in India, in your paper, you say it's a 50% plus decline over recent years um, in Indian enrolments, but the United States in the last year has seen a 29.4% increase um, how, how much of that kind of shift, that's a major shift there, is down to just the immigration changes and how much is down to the other bits and pieces? I, my argument on that would be that the, a large part of that has been down to the, the removal of post-study work, but also other changes that have occurred within the immigration system that I think makes the offer less attractive, more restrictive and less competitive than when people are comparing, contrasting, they have choice, they can go to other countries. When you look at that, 
uh, that adds up to, to make it uh, less attractive than it was before. So we can look at lots of things. You know, my institution is spending hundreds and hundreds of thousands of pounds a year having to uh, check that students are attending and engaging their courses. Uh, we now have the spectre of exit data being used to ensure that people depart the United Kingdom after they've uh, completed their studies. Uh, and some statistical unreliable, un unreliable statistical evidence there about the number of students that apparently are remaining uh, in the United Kingdom after their, after their studies uh, illegally, which I, I don't think is, is reliable uh, statistical evidence. So I, I, I think it goes back to, to the, 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 today's focus, obviously, in post-study work. There's no doubt at all the other changes that have taken place, uh, and some of that has impacted very significantly the English language in the college sector across the UK and Scotland. There is also an impact at the UK level. So. The quote earlier that I, I mentioned, just very, very briefly, this is the Director of Higher Education at the, the, the British Council, Thursday the 14th of January. Um, it is alarming that the UK's 1% growth is so small when compared to our competitors. And he goes on to quote, this is a verbatim quote, there is now a clear trend of the UK's global market share declining when compared to other countries, and we need to take urgent steps to address this and stem this decline. So it's not just universities, it's it's other organisations as well are saying, this is small, uh, this, is, this is growth, but at the very, very smallest level, if any, 1%, uh, during a period when you should be seeing much, much more significant uh, uh, growth in that, in that migration of talent uh, to the UK and to, to Scotland. Yeah. Just give us anything on that as well before yeah, we... Just, I was just... Sorry. sorry, sorry, sorry I, I was just going to ask a final question, which I covers and others could answer. Okay, when you go. Yeah, I think that given what you've said and... Um, and the evidence has been submitted to the committee. Um, I mean, would it be your opinion that there doesn't seem any, any likelihood, certainly in the short to medium term, of any change in UK government policy in this area in terms of changing or going back to the, the way that it was? And if that is your view, is it the case that you think that Scotland actually needs to have its own system, a system in place that effectively would allow us to attract students in the way that we certainly used to, and would give us that competitive advantage over some of the other uh, competing uh, English-speaking language countries in particular. And that... I didn't mean you. I meant Lucy, you meant Lucy I said no, that earlier. I assumed so that's you meant. <laughs> but I mean, you it, would it would apply equally yeah. to both. Well, I'll go quickly uh, on, on this, and maybe that's something to return to. Yeah, we should be looking at options, and there are, there are options here that we can have, uh, both for Scotland, and it could be tied into specific skills shortages in Scotland, where you can match the two up. And there are practical measures that can be taken. We've already heard uh, some of that from employers and also legal firms as well that have submitted evidence to the Scottish Affairs Committee on this. There are new ways. Next week, you will have landlord right to rent checks. These are landlords checking the immigration status uh, of, of uh, people in the UK, whether they can get access to, to housing in England and Wales. That starts next week. So you've got severe penalties there if, if, if that's not been checked. So, you know, in terms of where people go if they are staying on in Scotland or maybe not staying on in Scotland, there's measures there that would, would serve to actually stop that happening. Uh, there are things like income tax codes. Uh, there are biometric residence permits that, are, that could clearly state where somebody's uh, uh, permission to work is within a specific part of the UK. So both for the UK and also for Scotland, there are, we, we need to be looking really at, at clear options for... Uh, how a, 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 a targeted and focused approach to this that benefits Scotland, Scotland, not just universities and colleges, but our economy. And also, uh, uh, when you think of that, you know, just simple fact, where do businesses tend to invest? Look at some of the world's most successful cities and, and environments across the world. Uh, it's where, the, where there is talent that's, and where there is that immersion of global talent. That's where you start to see big businesses invest because they know they can get access to, to high-value uh, talent. There are... Simple practical steps that could be taken if there was the, the will to, to look at some of those options. There are options that could be explored both for Scotland and also at the UK level. We, we have a, a wealth of evidence on, on what that might look like. Well, then, Lucy, for the, for the further education sector, I mean, would a, would a, a Scotland-only scheme, um, given we, it looks like we can't have a UK scheme uh, that, that's, that involves post-study work visas, is a, is a Scotland-only work scheme something that the further education sector would, would certainly welcome? I think we would welcome it. Um, and I think we would like to make the case very clearly that um, higher national diplomas are something that should be covered by any post-study work um, visa scheme. Mm -hmm. um, seeing them, as I've said, as a qualification in their own right, 
which are developed in conjunction with employers so we know that students going out into employment with a higher national diploma are well qualified um, to help meet the needs of, of the job market in Scotland um, and also again as a feeder into to universities. Okay. Alison, do you want to um, begin asking questions from yes. Molan and Mary? Thank you. Um, I will direct my questions to, to Mary and Molan. And I should say here on the record that Mary and I have met previously. And Mary first contacted me to ask me to come and join in planting trees with the Kenyan Scots community. She does a lot of work, um, I think, promoting cultural cohesion and community cohesion and I've met her subsequently learning to throw the javelin at Meadow Bank. So I think it's fair to say that, that Mary, has, <laughs> she has Mary has brought far more than her academic abilities to Scotland. And I'm sure you've done the same too, Mullen. We'll hear more about that later. But I just wondered if you could tell us a bit more about your experiences. Um, how did you find out about the Fresh Talent Initiative? Was it easy to apply? What was your experience of being granted leave to remain? So if you could just cover a couple of those issues for us. Uh, I came to uh, Scotland in 2007 to study a master's in social work in the University of Stirling. When I came, I wasn't aware of the scheme, but the international office was very keen to let me know about the scheme and how I could apply. It was very important for me because the degree on itself wasn't directly transferable back to Kenya, and I needed the experience, which then I could build on to go and empower my, uh, my communities back home. So... There wasn't any transition for me if I finished the degree and tried to get into employment because the, the, the work permit would have been quite problematic to get because I needed to be earning a certain salary. And I don't think a, an employer would have taken me on board having no prior knowledge about who I was or what my work capability was. So the post study gave me that transition to be able to have the two years to kind of actually prove myself to uh, my employer that I'm worth uh, going through the hassle that they have to go through and apply for a work permit for uh, an, an EU or a UK employer, employee. So uh, I was very grateful to have this opportunity uh, to be able to actually work in UK and start gaining the experience which I felt was quite uh, worthwhile and continue contributing not just economically but also culturally and socially as well as um, bringing more a bit of diversity also in my workplace which my colleagues decided to actually appreciate even today. So I would say if it wasn't for the fresh talent I would ha have had to leave UK immediately because the tier one, which was the highly skilled uh, immigrant scheme, again, I hadn't gotten the points that I needed to be on that scheme either. So unless I was applying immediately to further my studies, there wasn't actually any other transition. So I was very uh, grateful to have the fresh talent to offer me the two years to study. Thank you for this opportunity to speak today. I originally come from Mumbai, India. Let me just run you through the steps and give you the other side of the coin of what goes through a student's mind when choosing a place of study, choosing a university. Five years ago, when I was sitting with a group of friends deciding to come and do further studies, I said to my friends, like, look, I'm going to do a master's outside of India somewhere. I need the experience. My friend said to me, oh, yes, I'm doing the same. And my third friend was sitting silent. I said, but you're not discussing where you are going. You're discussing where and what you want to do. We looked at our friend and said, of course it's UK, it's a no-brainer. The reason we said this is because we know that the quality of universities in UK is great, the legacy is great, the reputation is fantastic. That's one. Choosing UK was not the problem. Choosing which university within the UK, that's when the research starts. And just to give you a little background and a little perspective on what we go through when we choose these steps, first of all, we look at the tuition fees. For example, in my particular course, I did my master's in strategic marketing from the University of Glasgow in 2010. The fees was 12,000 pounds, which equates to 1.2 million rupees. That's one. Then you look at accommodation. You look at how the public transport is. What is the cost of living? You consider all this. My accommodation was 450 pounds a month. That is rupees 45,000 a month, which is more than the average wage. Then you look at living expenses because you don't just come without any cushion of any financial background. So you come with 2,000 pounds extra, that's rupees 200,000. 
and you come with extra miscellaneous expenses of a thousand pounds. So that all equates just even before entering the country of about 20,400 pounds, which equates to two, over two million rupees. Now, two million rupees is equivalent to buying a house somewhere on the outskirts of Mumbai. So you can imagine it's a very emotionally and financially investing decision. So we will do our research very strongly. We'll not just choose something and arrive. Our research has to be strong. We have to look at what are the offers. We have to look at what the kind of support that is before and after the course. It's not just about the course, because we look at the ecosystem of learn, build, and apply. It has to be that. When I came, when I landed here in Glasgow, University of Glasgow in 2010, I knew for a fact that after the university, I'm going to get my post-study work visa. I knew this before even coming into the country. And that is a major, major key point in choosing why I came here in the UK, especially in Glasgow University, because I knew after the course, I'm going to get this two years of stability. And through this, if I'm capable enough, if I'm skilled enough, I'll probably get a job. So this was a, there was a key key point in why I came to the UK. Because when we look at choosing university, we look at four important points. We look at the quality of the course offered. We look at the reputation of the university. Third and the most important thing is what is the kind of support we get before and after the course. That is key for a student who's investing such a huge amount in a, in a university, traveling 7,000 miles away from home alone, arriving in a country. It's a very nerve-wracking, nervous, and scary situation. Um, and fourth is what kind of experience can you get after the course? Is there support? Is there fair and balanced administrations where you, know, you can broaden your horizons? All this is taken into consideration. I have been lucky enough to pass through student visa, getting a post-study work visa, and currently on a tier two visa. I work for an employer based in Coatbridge. It's a small and medium enterprise. It's a good company who had to apply for a license before they could give me a tier two. So, the performance in my job has been there, but there are hurdles, there are complications. And due to these complications and due to these hurdles, there, there, there may be a situation where in the future, in spite of me entering the Indian market now, probably creating 10 new jobs in North Lanarkshire, I might have to pack my bags and leave just because there is a certain threshold in place. So all this comes into play. It's the whole ecosystem of built sorry, learn, build, and apply. At the moment, UK is offering learn here, build, and apply elsewhere. Such a big amount of investment, emotional investment, you have to take into consideration that we will do our research and we will go to a place which has a better offering. Very helpful. Alison, you. Um, so it's absolutely clear that if you hadn't had this guarantee that you'd be able to continue, you, your choices would have been made elsewhere. I wouldn't be sitting in front of you. If the post-study work visa wasn't there, which I knew for a fact that was available before I entered, it was a key, key factor for me. And can I ask you both, did you have enough support in terms of form filling, getting your head around the bureaucracy? Was there enough assistance? Has it been made as straightforward as it might have been? Uh, it, it was very, uh, the university international office were very supportive in the process of applying for the fresh talent scheme. And I felt I had, just like uh, Molin had spent nearly 50,000 uh, studying in the UK. And I, and I think that's why it's also important for the student to feel they are getting something back and not to have to pack their bags and leave immediately after qualification. So. Yes, thank you. I have been very lucky to come across very fair institutions like Scottish Enterprise, Talent Scotland, who have helped me along the way to understand the process, to you know, help me with the paperwork, to give me legal advice if, if needed, help the, my employer get the tier two license. So there have been institutions like Scottish Enterprise and Talent Scotland who have been extremely supportive and you know, I, I applaud because of the fairness and the balance of these kind of administrations which are available here. Of course, again, before coming here, I knew there was a Scottish Enterprise and a Talent Scotland in place. If ever I needed some kind of support outside of university, then the, it was available. Again, it was a key factor for me to choose why I came to University of Glasgow. So yes, there were uh, institutions which have helped me and supported me along the way so far. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Thank you. Rob? I wonder if Mary had the same experience, you know, if you, you good morning, and uh, uh, maybe you could tell us a little more about the kind of support that you had uh, in order to get from uh, getting 
uh, a degree or getting your qualification and moving into work. Just a little bit more detail because obviously um, it's different when you're doing uh, an MBA or a postgraduate degree. If you're doing a, a fundamental degree, you know, it uh, uh, means that you've got to then move on and uh, we've heard about the difficulties of moving from one to the other. So what sort of support did you have apart from the international office? Uh, uh, to get to the fresh talent, uh, the only support I had was from the university, but then from fresh talent to get my work permit, because then I had now two years where I had tried to show that I can do the job, I'm competent in the job I'm doing. So the, uh, my employer was then very supportive with applying for the tier two visa, which is the, the work permit. And the whole process was, they had somebody who had specifically gone to be trained by the home office on what's required and what's their obligations and responsibilities. But the big chunk of the paperwork, it's still for me to go out there and research online and find out what's the process from the home office website. But then there is a few tick box that the employer need to do and that's their responsibility to then go through that process. But I would say they were very supportive, both the university as well as the City of Edinburgh Council where I currently work. Am I correct in saying uh, th that uh, you were obviously moving in a social work direction, so you were getting some support from within uh, the potential employer or your... Only when I was already in the employment and worked for two years. So if I didn't have the fresh talent visa, I wouldn't have been able to get any employer who take me on just as a student without having worked for some time for the employer. Okay, thank you. Okay. Willem, do you want to pick up on any of that? Just um, in terms of support that I received from, I've been very lucky because I've got my job through Talent Scotland. They had the Talent Scotland graduate program in place. Through that, I got the current job that I am in. Still, I am in the same company. So that way, it was very supportive. In another way, it was supportive was after I wanted to move from a post-study work visa into a tier two, what are the kind of requirements? What are the kind of paperwork? What does an employer have to do from their end? What are the kind of legal assistance? Every single point that need to be checked, Scottish Enterprise and Talent Scotland supported me in that. They told me exactly what is needed. The, if the paperwork, once I kept the paperwork ready, is that paperwork ready, good enough or not? So all this kind of support, it gives you a certain peace of mind and even puts the employer at peace because he's kind of flustered about, about the complications and the paperwork that they need to keep ready from their end as well. So if there is some kind of support, there is some kind of competent outside consultant who helps you in what the process is, it puts both the parties at a peace of mind and then it kind of makes it easier to move forward. Entry to uh, uh, Alan, um, I was thinking about our own local university, the U University of the Highlands and Islands, where you can move from certificates through to PhDs. Is the same cut-off between an HND and a degree uh, a problem for students there? No, I think w what you've seen is the, the, the difficulty of moving from the college sector up into degree level. Uh, the progression is still available there. There's very, very strict requirements around academic progression. If you're not progressing across a course or up through a course onto different levels of study within the university, there are problems and people will need to, students will need to return home. Uh, but that, that's okay. And we fought long and hard as a sector in Scotland to show that there are differences in Scotland in terms of the length of time that you spend here as an undergraduate and also for professional programmes. So we spent a lot of work working with colleagues uh, uh, both here and uh, across Scotland, ensuring that we protected that uh, because that wasn't straightforward. But that, that's okay. But it's, it's that progression from maybe someone English language to college or college English language and then on to university uh, that's much, much more problematic. And I dare say with uh, uh, fewer rights now that, that a student would have as an international student within a Scottish college than they previously had before the changes, many, many changes, not just post-study work, have been introduced. In terms of the Fresh Talent Initiative, uh, was that uh, a factor in you choosing to come to Scotland? Uh, I was uh, doing my degree in London, so uh, it's, it wasn't the factor that I chose Scotland. It was Scottish beauty, to be honest. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> and yeah, then when, yeah, I, I when I came over and I was told about the Fresh Talent Scheme, that's the reason I stayed. So although it wasn't the reason I came, it was the reason I stayed in Scotland. Okay, no, that's helpful. Um, you should get a job for Visit Scotland as well. <laughs> <laughs> um, 
Uh, well, in, in terms of, uh, you mentioned at the beginning that, uh, you were, you, that you knew that you were going to be staying afterwards. Uh, what was the process for that? And how did you, uh, how, how were you guaranteed that you were going to be staying afterwards? What was the, what happened? Um, just after the course? Uh, yes, well, before you came here, you said when you were doing your research. Yes. Uh, before you came to, to, to Scotland, uh -huh. that you knew that you were going to stay afterwards. Yes. And that was guaranteed? Yeah, um, so when I was doing my research, I found out that there is this process called the pro-study work visa, which guarantees you to stay in the UK for two years. It allows you to probably find a job, build up your skills. So that was, I knew before entering the country, and that was a quite supportive decision in terms of why I chose the course which I did okay. and the university which I did. Okay. And everything worked out for the best, and Scotland, of course, has been great. No regrets whatsoever. Okay, and my final question is actually to, to both of you. Uh, in terms of going forward, um, obviously the situation that, uh, that the, the UK finds itself in now is not helpful in terms of the post-study work visas. Um, would, you, <coughs> excuse me, would you have any recommendations for, uh, certainly for us as a committee, but also the politicians uh, across the UK, and would you have any recommendations to, to us all in terms of what you, you think um, or what you believe uh, should be the way forward? I think personally for me it, it was a great uh, opportunity that I was offered to be able to contribute to the economy of the UK and there will be so many students who will choose to come to Scotland because of finding that they can actually have those two years to be able to make a transition either to go back home or to stay and get an employer who will apply the work permit for them. So it's a, it's a great incentive to, uh, to increase the international students who not just contribute economically afterwards but also the tuition fees that we normally have to pay. I think it's uh, just based on that, it's, it's, a, it's, a good, it's very good to actually bring it back because I think it has really benefited so many uh, students and so many of my friends who I know who are on the same scheme. So I would be very much uh, recommending that if it can be looked at into be brought back in Scotland, even if it's not for the whole of UK, but really in Scotland. For me, it was more of an emotional thing as well because now many of the potential students who want to consider UK as a destination to study sometimes contact me and say, okay, what's the kind of situation? What should I do? Do you have some kind of advice for me? What I try to do is I give, try to give them a very, very fair picture of what is happening right now, what may happen in the future. What they tell me and what bothers me the most is, as Alan mentioned before, UK does seem to be a little bit unwelcoming right now. And that, for me, is the most damaging in terms for my recommendation to the committee would be to just consider the emotional side of things as well, not just the financial and economical, because students are more and more feeling that UK is turning more unwelcoming. And I know for a fact that UK universities are one of the best in the world. So it's in order for them to remain the best in the world, they have to be open to the world. Right now, they're building walls, and I don't know how long that legacy and the quality will remain in the minds of students who want to come here and study. So the emotional side of thing of the quality and the legacy that needs to be preserved. Thank you. So, so just one final point, if I may. It's not, it's not a question, just a quick, very brief point. Just, uh, I studied uh, abroad. I studied in France, Germany and Sweden. So your point regarding the emotional side of things is something that I wholeheartedly recognise. And I think it's a very strong point that you put on the record. Thank you. Okay. Now, Mula, I think you mentioned issues to do with pay thresholds. And I think Malcolm, you were interested in that area, weren't you? Well, I, I was just interested about whether you're concerned, any or all of you, about indications that the Home Office plans to introduce a pay threshold for non-EU migrants of £35,000. And do you think this may deter students or further deter students on any future scheme from the remaining in the UK and working on a Tier 2 or indeed any other visa? Happy to pick, pick that up. So the Migration Advisory Committee, has, which was tasked with looking at ways in which Tier 2 could be further restricted, basically, by the, the government, has come up with a set of recommendations in the past couple of weeks, which includes increasing the threshold uh, to 23,000, just over 23,000 for switchers. So these would be Tier 4 graduates moving from uh, Tier 4 into Tier 2. So that would move that salary, minimum salary threshold up for new entrants into, into that category. It further introduces uh, tax on talent. So there's a 1,000 surcharge for every employer who's looking to take on uh, an international uh, uh, student or migrant into their, into their work. So when we looked at this in the Russell Group, uh, of which University of Edinburgh is a part of, the UK's sort of front-end research universities, uh, that'll cost over £7 million a year, effectively a tax on talent that's being introduced in, in that area. 
Uh, and, and yes, there are uh, uh, further changes that, that have been put forward by the Migration, the migration Advisory Committee, uh, which include also subjecting students who are moving from Tier 4 to Tier 2 uh, to not just higher salary thresholds, but also subjecting them to the resident labour market test, of which they're, not, they're exempted from at the present time. And further to that, they're also intending that uh, international graduates moving from 4 to, to Tier 2 are also now subject to the uh, cap that exists there. So what you're going to see is pretty significant pressure on that cap. Uh, and it's a further tightening of the existing routes, which are already quite restrictive. 5,867, if you look across all opportunities for students graduating in the UK, if you add up all the, all the routes, all the possibilities, Home Office figures, it's 5,867 and declining. So it's, it's small, restrictive. And if these recommendations are put through, then as well as the, the, the move to the 30,000 plus, then you've got an even, an even greater tightening of an already uh, less competitive package. Are you quite happy with Malcolm? Yeah, well, that was really the main. I suppose I suppose I was interested just in terms of um, Mary and Mullen about how, what was your exp experience? I mean, of transitioning to a, a tier two visa, and I suppose related to the previous question, how do you think that compared with what the position that will face uh, future uh, applicants? Just to be absolutely practical and realistic, it is it's almost next to impossible for a small and medium enterprise right now to meet the thresholds which are being recommended. It is, just to be honest, because I've gone through the process, so that's why I can say this with at utmost confidence. When I went from tier four to tier two, there was already a threshold in place and my employer had to increase my wage in order to do that. But fortunately, my performance and my employer had enough faith and trust in me that I'll do better in the future, was willing to increase the wage to a certain point and then went on to get the sponsor license and then give me the tier two. Today, with the thresholds in place, my employer can simply not afford to keep me on. And it's wrong on my part to even expect for my employee to pay me such wages. So what is going to happen is in spite of everything being perfect, I will have to kind of give it, give it up and probably go back home. And how damaging is that to an individual's future and career and at the same time to an employee who has complete, com is completely comfortable and confident in one of his employees, that will just break the relationship, which is not right. Maybe you want to? Um. I think that mostly what happens is there's lots of uh, goalposts moving. So you, you work towards one goal and you're trying to reach there. You're trying to get that uh, threshold of the salary. And then just when you're about to reach there, then the home office changes the rules. And, and that's, it's been a very emotional process from the, the 10 years I've been here, just keep on, keeping on trying to go with the goalpost. And it's moved. And it's like a hoop after a hoop you have to jump. So, so I think the process is quite tedious. Okay, that's fine, thanks. Okay. On, on, just on that area, um, to just check something out, there's something called the shortage occupation list. What do you think the impact of this further restrictions will have on this sh shortage occupation list? Which areas of the Scottish economy in terms of skills are most likely to be impacted upon? Has anyone got a feel for that? Because I understand IT is a particular area, but I wanted to make sure I was right on that hunch. Alan, I don't know if you can pick up on that. I, I think what you, you, you'll see is that certainly from, in terms of international students graduating from Scottish universities, uh, the, the, the further tightening because of the increasing salary thresholds, the tax on talent, particularly for small to medium enterprises, which is the backbone of the Scottish economy, uh, the, the, the compliance regime that they have to, uh, to deal with. Um, there are only six... Home Office figures that I could get uh, when I looked at it, 672 employers across all of Scotland and Northern Ireland that are actively using, actively using certificates of sponsorship uh, through uh, Tier 2. So there's a question there about employers finding this attractive as well, and clearly they're not really engaging with it because they're, they don't, particularly with a small company having to take hugely expensive legal advice, uh, trailing through hundreds of pages of documents to ensure that they're complying uh, with all the regulations, that the sign-up doesn't seem to be, it seems to be very, very small for, for the sector. Uh, so this in terms of the shortage occupation 
uh, lists or resident labour market test, subjecting students to that as well will just further restrict uh, the, the ability for uh, uh, that talent to remain in Scotland across the, the areas that have been identified in Scotland as being skill shortage areas. And there was one report, and I would need to, to look at that, the, the title of that report that had identified there being skill shortages within sort of digital ICT of about 10,000 a year in Scotland uh, that cannot be sourced locally in Scotland or the UK. Now, I've got a couple of other people who want to ask some questions. I think, Linda, you had some specific things on the college, and Mark wanted to ask questions about consultation issues. So, just to give Lucy a chance to contribute here, do you want to start off in your area? Yes, yeah, OK. Um, there's a couple of things, Lucy, that I, I would quite like you to clarify from the, the evidence you put in to give us a broader understanding of it. Um, there, there were three things in particular that I'll just say to you straight off. One was um, you said, and I think you repeated earlier here, um, that you feel that um, policies re-international students are less favourable to colleges. So there was that. Um, a, a wee bit more information about the opportunity to work while studying, I think, is important, as well as post-studying, and that's something that's been difficult for colleges, I know. And you're referring your evidence to embedded colleges, private providers, being treated differently and more favourably under the current rules than publicly funded colleges. I wonder if you could expand on that a bit. Okay. Um, embedded colleges, really the point there is that, as we've mentioned previously, international tier four students studying at a further education college, even on a higher education programme, are required to leave the UK when they complete their higher national diploma in order to articulate onto a degree at a university. Students studying at a private provider which is attached to a university are not required to leave. So that means that um, they don't incur the cost of returning home. They don't have to then show maintenance funds again. Um, for an international student, they have to demonstrate that they have had over £9,000 in their bank account for 28 consecutive days within a 30-day period of making their visa application. So this is a large undertaking for, for international students. Can I um, get more clarification on that before you move on to the other two, if you don't mind? Because I don't really understand what they are. You mentioned INTO or INTO and CAPLAN. Um, what actually are they? They are providers um, attached to universities, but they are not, they are not the university itself. And what they do is they prepare students who perhaps would not have the entry qualifications for university um, to immediately start studying at a university. So where a university may have an entry qualification of, say, an IELTS score of six, you may have an international student who doesn't quite meet that English language requirement. So they have the option to study at, many of them choose to study at a further education college to prepare themselves for university. Some choose to go to a, a private provider attached to a university because it's actually then easier for them to go on to study a degree at the university. So, so that, that is a very clear example. Of, of a difference in how institutions are treated? Yes. Yeah. I, I think we should maybe look into that a wee bit more, Katrina. I find that interesting. Um, I'm trying to remember the other things I asked you about. Oh, um, yeah, the, the, well, working, I mean, another, the working while studying. Yeah, the, the, I mean, that's just uh, another example. Um, again, I know I keep coming back to it. International students studying at a further education college is are studying higher education programmes. So they're studying higher national diplomas equivalent to the first two years of a university degree, and yet they do not have the right to work um, at all um, while they're studying in the UK. So they have no means of um, gaining work experience other than on a work placement, which is an assessed part of their, their course of study. So... Does it actually mean then that they are disadvantaged in their study because they're not allowed to do the work placement or do they end up having to work for nothing? 
are they're allowed if a work placement is already a part of their programme, they're allowed to participate in that work placement as long as it's not more than 33% of the programme. However, they're not allowed to, for example, have a weekend job and work 20 hours per week as a university student would be able to do in order to support themselves um, while they're here in the UK. It also disadvantages them in the sense that, you know, they're not they're not practising their English, they're not integrating into the community you know, in the way that they perhaps would have previously before the rules changed. Um, so it disadvantages them in many different ways. Is that a direct difference between college students and university exactly, students? Exactly, yes. Right. Also in your evidence, Lucien, you mentioned it earlier, you know, that you can only talk about your own college, but the population having reduced year on year, so you've gone from 150 international students in 2011 to one uh, this year. That's a huge drop. What's the actual, well, what's the bottom line for that, for your college? Um, well, obviously it's a huge reduction in fee income. Um, but I'd, I would stress that the, it's not just about the money for a college such as ours. It's really important for our UK-based students who may not otherwise have that opportunity um, to, to work, to study, to socialise in a multicultural environment. Um, you know, and if the ultimate aim of our college is to prepare students for the world of work and prepare them to be global citizens, that's what we're trying to do, to enable them to be socially mobile. Um, and you know, really they're being disadvantaged as well because they are not having that opportunity. Yeah, that, that leads on to something I was going to say because, you know, we all know that of late uh, colleges have been very much focused on full-time courses that lead to the world of work. And it would seem to me that it's like different policy levers that are contradicting each other rather than working, working together here. Um, so on one hand, you've got a Scottish government which is very focused on work and colleges helping very much in that and economic growth. And on the other hand, you've got the Westminster government that's having no recognition of what Scotland requires in that. And in fact, between that and the earnings thresholds that don't always apply in Scotland are very much working against each other in policy terms. Which I suppose leads back, convener, to that question about whether there should in fact be a specific Scottish scheme that suits the, the conditions of both the education sector and the economics of Scotland. Is that a question or a comment? Well, yeah, it would be a question. Is that something um, that, that our panellists would feel they could comment on? And then I've got one little thing after. Uh -huh. um, I mean, I, I would tend to agree. As Molly and Mary have said, it was, it was a huge factor in them making their decision about where they would come to study. And if our ultimate aim is to get people ready to go out into the world of work, if we're not then allowing them that opportunity at the end of their programme, we're not really fulfilling our aim. Okay. Very tiny supplementary. Yes, yes, yes. About something Marlon said earlier, um, you are talking about sitting with your friends, Marlon, and talk about where you were going to come. And I thought that was really important. And it, it was also in, in Lucy's evidence about network marketing, which that, that's direct there, about students going home and telling of their experience and stuff. And I wonder if we're seriously in danger, unless we, we're able to do something about this, of damaging our prospects. Um, would you feel that, Marilyn, that, that uh, here we had a wonderful way of marketing because of the good experience, going home, telling people, and it's been taken away, and, and we can suffer in the, the medium and longer term. I can sum it up in one sentence. Five years ago, for me, education was an investment in UK. Today, for an Indian student wanting to come here, education is a cost, and that's where the difference is. It's no more an investment, it's a cost. You spend such a big amount of money, you stay here for one year, and then you're not given a fair chance or an opportunity, not a job, just an opportunity to stay on and see what you can do after your course. It doesn't justify the costs and efforts, so it seems as a cost more than an investment. That's where the danger is. Thank you very much.
Uh, just quickly agreeing, agreeing with that and what was said uh, also by Lucy as well. So when you go back, there's an interesting statement. Winston Churchill in 1943 at Harvard talked about uh, the empires of the future, slightly prophetically, but the empires of the future being empires of the mind. And I think you've got more and more countries, cities as well across the world, who recognise that this is not just about the balance of power, but it's about the balance of brains. Uh, and this talent and also Scotland's universities and colleges as well uh, have a huge role to, to play in that. I've said it in the, the submission as well. This is a global race for talent. It's, it's that simple, and, and people have choice. People have choice like they've never had choice before. And this is critically important, not just to universities or to colleges, but to Scotland's economy, Scotland's workforce, and jobs in Scotland. It's that simple, and it's not just, I think, the, the, uh, the panel here that are, that are saying that. It's not just universities and colleges. It's Scottish businesses. It's Scottish employers. It's Scottish academia. I, I, I could go on. So... Uh, but that, that, that quote, that comment, the balance of brains and the balance of power is something in a public policy sphere uh, that more and more governments and city authorities across the world are having a very, very close look at for a better integrated approach to, to all of this uh, with regards to high value uh, talent migration. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Um, Mark. Uh, th thank you, <coughs> convener. Uh, and, and if I can offer an apology to Marlon and Mary, my questions will generally be for for Lucy and Alan, but I do think the evidence you've put on the record today has been absolutely superb and there's some really good, strong stuff there. Um, I just want to read a, a couple of quotes from the recent UK government statement and the evidence that David Mundell gave to the uh, Scottish Affairs Committee. In the statement, the UK government said the UK has an excellent post-study work offer for graduates of Scottish universities seeking to undertake skilled work in the UK after their studies. And Mr Mundell followed that up at the Scottish Affairs Committee saying, as I said in the written ministerial statement, the UK government believed that such schemes already exist and indeed, as the Prime Minister said, uh, are world beating. So my question is, do you think that's a reflection of reality? So I can go first on that in terms of, uh, we talked about this earlier, but um, so in Australia, you can stay up to four years after you finish your, your studies. Uh, Canada, you can stay for the same length of time the length of time you're spending on your particular programme. So it was a four-year degree, you have, you have uh, four years. The United States of America, at the moment, you have the Department for Home and Security this week lobbying to actually extend their OPT programme for post-study work to up to three years. Uh, and they've been given an extra couple of months uh, to look at that, about how they would, how they would do that. Uh, as I said, if you taught up all the different routes, so if you look, these are home office figures. So the doctoral extension scheme for the whole of the United Kingdom you had 330 successful entrants into the doctoral extension scheme, stay one year after your PhD completes in the whole of the UK in 2015. The graduate entrepreneur route, last figures I have, 2014, 560 for the whole of the UK, and 5,500 through tier two in 2015. So it's a very small number of the 310, 320,000 non-EA students that we've got currently studying in the United Kingdom that are able to progress on, on these routes. Uh, the employer bit is interesting as well. It's not just students, it's the employers. The employer uptake is small. It's cumbersome and bureaucratic for the small to medium enterprise sector, of which, Scott, again, I said, is the backbone of the Scottish economy. So it, I think when you look at the figures, when you look at the hard figures, uh, compared to what's happening elsewhere and what's on offer elsewhere, um, and I've said that in terms of uh, I, I don't see it as being competitive as the other offers that are on the table, as uh, so eloquently was described in terms of the choice and the detailed research that students will do prior to making what is a very significant emotional, financial uh, uh, commitment to study thousands of miles away from uh, their, their home location. So, so, so world beating apart from lots of other countries. Um, so uh, can I ask in terms of consultation, um, what consultation or otherwise took place with either colleges or universities uh, in advance of the decision to remove the post-study work visa? Uh, again, Lucy, Lucy there, was, there was no consultation. What we were left dealing with, and I think that would apply to Lucy and also to myself and many colleagues across the education sector in terms of colleges and universities, we were at the front end when this was removed with almost no, no notification and having to actually talk to students and dependents that they had with them as well to say, I know that the decision to come here was, for many of you, largely predicated on the ability for the quality of the education first and foremost, but also your offer around the Fresh Talent uh, scheme or the Tier 1 scheme uh, 
uh, as was. We're sorry to tell you, not our decision, uh, but you're no longer able to do that. And you can imagine uh, what that did. It didn't exactly win us many friends, uh, and who we were at the front end of the ire on that, uh, if I can put it diplomatically, in, in terms of... Uh, that, that did, we didn't win many friends around that. We effectively pulled the rug from people's feet, under people's feet, uh, which I think would, would have left a, a particular sour taste in the mouth by those students who then had to depart, having come here with the, 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 being reassured that that would be an option for them, and it was pulled partly through their studies. And, and Lucy, I don't know if you have anything to add in, in yeah, terms I mean, of that. It was, um, I don't recall any consultation as an institution, it was a huge loss to us, but more importantly for our students. Um, I know that the vast majority of the students studying on our, our programmes then went on to the post-study work visa. Some of them then went on to other tiers. Many of them used it as an opportunity to work and to save money to then go on to university. So really, I think we, we were missing we're missing a trick there. And I think that ties in very much with, with, with the evidence that Malwin put on the record about the, the investment that these people will have put in in order to come here with predicated on the basis that they were going to get to stay uh, after their studies. But can I ask then, following up from that, because obviously the Smith Commission had a very clear recommendation around post-study work visas. Um, the Smith Commission conclusions were, you know, they're now over a year old. Um, has there been any contact or consultation from the UK government following that recommendation by the Smith Commission regarding post-study work visas with Scottish institutions? I've received uh, nothing directly. The only connection that we've had on post-study work has been the Scottish Government's uh, post-study work uh, group that's been meeting with cross-party representation, which we, have through the university, have, have been part of and all through, through other sector organisations at University of Scotland. Okay. And Lucy, from the further education sector? No, no consultation. Okay. It's very interesting. Thank you, Convener. A ranging discussion. I, I think unless there's any <coughs> new areas that people want to open up and or ask any questions, then I think we've probably come to the end of this particular... Well, let's, I, I, I need to move on now, Stuart. I'm sorry. I need to just make sure that we, we get ourselves... How quick is this supplementary? Very quick. Right. Very quick. It has it's to be. Just, it was based upon I want to finish this by quarter two. Yeah, it's very quick. It's based upon Alan's comments actually earlier on, um, and certainly the submission that we received from universities, um, Scot Scottish universities as well. But uh, let's see if I can find the thing now. Uh, you spoke earlier on regarding the, the economic boom uh, and the lack of growth in student numbers, uh, and in the University of Scotland uh, submission. Um, they highlight that uh, when you consider what this, this has actually happened uh, and, the, the, and when you consider what's going to happen over the course of the next couple of years and, and, and the future in terms of the, the economy from China, um, how do you see things if there is no policy changes with this? How do you see the, the university sector but also maybe the college sector in Scotland actually been affected uh, by, uh, by what's, been, what's been going on, particularly because of this, the, the economic situation, the economic changes uh, from China? So, so what you've got happening is uh, by 2030 we'll have four countries in the world accounting for over 50% of all global tertiary enrolments. That's the United States, Canada, uh, sorry, the United States, uh, China, India and Brazil. So you've got a polarisation going on here. Uh, and I think that was referenced in the University of Scotland statement about we need, we need the diversity uh, from a range of nations. There's great strength in diversity. Uh, uh, for, for what we do as education institutions, bringing the best from different countries uh, uh, across the world. So you've got polarisation occurring, and I think that can be, there, there are, there, there's risk mitigation that you need to look at in, in relation to that. Uh, there is a direct impact, it's not just for universities and colleges in terms of uh, the, the, the fees that students might pay, but there's also a direct impact on the internationalisation of our labs and our lecture theatres and the quality of our output. We want to work with the brightest and the best around the world. And if we, if we make that more difficult, if we cut that off, we do it at, at, at our peril. So I, I think to, to sustain world-class leading research and education and teaching, we need to be able to attract the brightest and the best from uh, across the world. And, and I think ensuring that we have a competitive package on that keeps that, that, keeps that uh, a range of countries uh, able to come to Scotland and, and to attend college and universities is, is, is critically, critically important. And I think what you've seen, I mentioned eight of the, I've referenced it in the evidence, eight of the ten top ten sending countries from outside the European Union have seen, it, it, have seen a decline 
in, in the last couple of years, eight out of the ten. Uh, so, and, and even those increases, are, as I said, at the UK level, Higher Education Statistics Authority research, it's a 1% uh, increase. So there, there, are, there, are, there are direct implications for colleges and universities. There are direct implications also for the economy and Scotland's economy and jobs in this economy if this continues to, to go the way in which it is at, at, at the moment. Thank you. You want to add anything to that, Lucy? Or? OK. Well, listen, folks, I'm sorry. That I'm going to have to curtail this session because I need to finish the public session by quarter two and we'll still have one other item to get through. But listen, I'm very grateful for the witnesses coming along today. I think some of the evidence we heard not only built on significantly on the paperwork that we already received in written forum. And some of the evidence was compelling and interesting. So I'm very, very grateful to you for coming along today and helping flesh out and bring it alive for us in the way certainly that Mullen and Mary did in some of the technical detail for Lucy and Alan. It was a very, very useful session. Thank you very much. I want to move on now immediately to deal with uh, item two on our, our agenda, which is in regard to the committee visit to Spain. That We have a paper in front of us. Um, I was going to say a few words about it, but given the time scale, I'll defer on that. Duncan, I don't know if you want to add anything. No, no other than you know, the very last paragraph, I think, um, um, we, you know, at 30, I think, is a great summary. Um, that, that, that accordingly, the meetings we held in Spain reaffirmed our view that implementing the principles in transparency and accountability into the governmental processes, which will underpin further devolution and powers proposed in Seville, is not only necessary, but eminently achievable. And I think that's what we found out in Spain. It's a, it's a great summary of the visit, that many of the things that we have been examining here and questioning were confirmed in the Spanish uh, experience, but they have overcome them, and there are processes and principles that can be applied to deal with, with, deal with a, a new and evolving situation, and that was happening. Well, I think the key bits for me were in paragraph 16, 17, 18, in terms of how the, the, the Spanish Constitutional Court worked alongside the bilateral commissions that existed and where they didn't operate, how people had the ability to take it to the, the Spanish Constitutional Court. The Corteza could go direct to the court the autonomous bodies had to go through a more elaborate process to get there, but also the way that the, the transparency existed through that process at the end, particularly in paragraph 18, I think, describes well some of the real key learning that was done from that. If there are no other further comments, but there are no other further comments, I now there, I, I therefore want to remind the committee that we'll meet again next week when we'll consider an update on the Scotland Bill. I now close this meeting.